I could feel my soul leaving my body and everything kind of disappears. And then next thing I know, it's like I'm at a party of some kind. I would feel like I'd connect to these like angelic beings. I hear the TV turn into demonic voices. They're talking about me. They say his name is Josh. We need to destroy him. I feel myself falling out and I hear them like, he's falling out. And when I look, there's demons like standing in a line and it's leading me to this door. But when we get to it, it stops. And it, as it's turning to look at me, it says one more step, you're almost there. Hello and welcome back to the Almost False Podcast where I interview regular people with incredible stories. Today's guest has a testimony that has amassed millions of views already. He used to be a drug addict, but among the substances he was abusing were psychedelics. And being very familiar with all kinds of mind-altering states, he brings a unique perspective when it comes to the connection between the physical and spiritual realm. We talked about his life and some of the weirdest experiences he's had, but I'll warn you in advance, it is pretty dark. However, if you can make it to the end, you will see how all of his experiences connect. Without further ado, Here's the fascinating and bone chilling story of Joshua Sadkoff. Well, I had I had been doing mushrooms and acid for a while, like since since like sophomore year, like when I came back from the rehab. And so I never really had extremely crazy visuals as far as like seeing actual things appear or seeing you know, it's like the mall, the walls melt, your hand trails, you, you see colors are exaggerated, you, you know, th things are different, you hallucinate, but it's not like, you know, people joke or like, you know, stigmatize like, oh, the pink elephant and pops in the room and stuff. like, you don't see stuff mm -hmm. like that. At least I never did, um, you know, but I would hallucinate, but anyways, not to that degree. And so anyways, I remember the first time I did DMT it was, uh, I was, I was with a friend and I had known what it was for a while. And so when I got it, I was kind of excited. And, and basically we, you know, I'm at this guy's house and I remember I hit it and he's like, yeah, once, once you, once you, you hit it like three times. And then there's like this moment where you feel like you can't move and you can't take another puff and then you hit it again. And then that's when you kind of like, so that's what I did. And I, I remember I, I, I like fight to go to that last little puff or whatever. And then next thing I know, I lay down on the bed and it felt like I had a gunshot wound in my back. Like it felt like I just had this perfectly like cut out circle in my back and I could feel my soul leaving my body. Like the way water comes down or goes down a drain. It was like I could feel my soul just draining out of my body, like down water down a bathtub. And I remember thinking I'm dying right now. And and I was like, oh, wait, no, I don't I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't. But then I like kind of checked in and I was like, Josh, it's just DMT, you know, like you can't die. This it's this is what's you know, I'm talking myself through it. I'm like, this is what's released when you die. This is why you're feeling like you're gonna die. So I'm like, okay. And that kind of calms me down. But it was it was the scariest thing I ever felt. Like I remember I was like, dude, I feel like I'm dying right now. Like I feel my body my soul leaving my body one hundred percent. And so I, I'm feeling everything and I I feel myself like emptying. And next thing I know, it's like I'm sinking in the bed a little bit. And everything kind of disappears. So the room just kind of expands. And then next thing I know, as I'm looking at the ceiling, it's like I'm at a party of some kind. But I, I can't. It's almost like, uh, you, you know, when you see things blurred in a camera, it's kind of like that image where nothing was crystal clear. But it was like I could see these blurred images and there was all these people dancing and it was like a party. And there was this one girl that was like standing in front of me. She had one of those lollipops that you would see at like a carnival. And she's like, they're all happy to see me. Like they're like celebrating me being there. And I, I mean, I, in my right mind, in my sober mind, I'm like, this is crazy. Cause I had done all these psychedelics before, but I'm sitting here like now I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm not here. Like I'm, I'm in my, in my mind internally freaking out at how real this experience is. And I'm like looking at this girl, she's dancing around, they're celebrating this. And then all of a sudden it was like, they were pushing me down. I can't explain. It. it was like, they were gathering around me and I was sinking. And it was like, I could, they were doing hand movements. Like they were taking dirt and putting it on top. Like they were burying me. And so I remember it was like, they're, I'm sinking. And it's like, they're throwing this like imagine imaginary dirt on top of me and I'm sinking. I'm like, no, no, stop. Why are you guys? And they're happy about it. And they're like laughing and they're like, and I'm sinking. And this thing only lasts, you know, 10, 15 minutes. So then it starts fading out. And I remember I sit up, I could see like my aura and I'm like looking around the room and I'm like, dude, what? what you know what i mean i'm just shocked i'm like what is what is was that you know like that was like that was real and now you're just like back in this normal world and so uh 
that was like my first experience with it. And I was just like, dude, this is a just, it kind of, it kind of like crapped on like my entire existence as, you know, like it, it made me like question everything I ever thought in my entire life. Like I'm, I, at that point I was like, dude, what is, what is life? You know, was like, <laughs> like what is life kind of moment, you know? So, yeah. Did you have any expectations going into it? Like, did, did you think something like that would happen or like, what was your thought process before doing that? I don't know. I, I, th I don't know. I thought, I thought it was going to be kind of like acid, but just more intense. Um, and it was, it, it definitely was, but it also was like, it's not something you like, like walk around on, you know, like, it's not like something you like, just right. go like, cause I was got, I got to the point where I was getting, you know, some of these psychedelics and I was, I was shooting up, uh, the, the research chemicals. I was taking acid tabs and shooting them up. And like, like I was getting to the point where I could like kind of be coherent. Like I could walk around and go, go about my day. And you, you know, you wouldn't really know I was even on it, but this stuff was like debilitating. Like you're like, you're not doing nothing on this. You're, you're laid out and you're going to go somewhere else. Um, so it, it was, it was just 10 times more intense than I thought that it was going to be, um, basically. And going back to what I said earlier about these doors opening to me from the outside, it seemed like that was another door that opened and I don't know how long it took, but you eventually got to a point where you wanted to end your life and you tried that didn't work obviously because you're here today, but can you explain the story of what happened that day? Uh, because I still can't wrap my head around it. Yeah, that's a, that's, so that's a good good point to segue into because so basically with all this stuff happening, right? Like all these years, I'm using the DMT or the acid or whatever I could touch. Uh, there, there was even a, a time for a couple of years I was really heavily doing PCP. Actually, that was another one that was like a, is actually a spiritual thing for me. Uh, and I'm going using these things to connect to that because I would like smoke D or P PCP and and like I would feel like I'd connect to these like angelic beings and I would really, I'd feel like they were like, yeah, you have a destiny. And like, you know, like they would be like pumping me full of this like false reality where I would think like, I'm like some, I would think I'm like the reincarnation of Gandhi. And I'm thinking I'm like the reincarnation of some like giant spiritual being that I th thought was cool or something. Right. Like, and so I would do these drugs and that's what it, they would make me feel like, like internally, like you just have to wait for your time. It's like, so I'm thinking that there's like some method, all this madness going on, but then simultaneously I'm coming off these drugs and I'm more depressed than I was two months ago. And it's just slowly going down, down, down. So now we hit this point where I have a kid, I have nothing. My best friend dies. I don't have really any friends anymore. My other best friend, you know, it's like all of my friendships that were kind of decent friends seem like they're falling away. The other decent friends that I had growing up, like are distancing themselves because I'm an addict. Um, and so everything's falling apart. And so basically one night I'm sitting on my porch and I'm, I'm drinking some, I think I was drinking a four loco and some wine <laughs> and I'm sitting there just by myself, sitting out there on the porch. I'm in the, you know, in the woods on my, that's my house is in the woods. And I remember I sat there and I said, I think I'm done. It was a very nonchalant moment. I had a couple of tears in my eyes and I remember I was sitting out on the porch and I said, yeah, I think I'm done. They're like, what's the point? I walk in my house, grab, I had a microphone cable. I grabbed that because I thought it was poetic. <laughs> Cause I, I was rapping at the time. I thought it was a poetic thing and grab my microphone cable and, and I tied around this, uh, civil war post. It was a civil war fence. And, um, and on the drive, like my house was like here. And then on the left side of the house was basically, it, it was a cliff. Uh, it was like a little mini cliff, like a 20 foot drop on one part and then like a 20 foot downhill on the other part. And then it was a, it was a, a, a stream that went connected to like a larger river or whatever. And so on the part where there was the cliff, it had, you know, it was like a 20 foot drop. And then it was like a, a smaller little creek that bent around this like little mini island thing. It's hard to hard to kind of explain, but that just kind of gives you a general idea of the map of it. So I walk over to the the cliff part tied around the, the civil war post tied around my neck double knot everything make sure it's all good tight and i'm standing there and i have like this moment of really like knowing that i actually did this like thinking this is what i wanted i said dude i'm done my life's ruined and uh you know when you're in that state you also think that you're doing everyone a service you know you think that you're doing something good for your your 
your daughter. I think I'm I'm saving her from having to live with me. I think, you know, you, that's how you think. You know, I remember that, like, you know, like, just feeling like, what else am I going to live for? There's not, nothing else. I, like, I knew I was enslaved. I, you know what I'm saying? I remember I, I was laying there, you know, sta- standing there like, uh, you're, I always used to tell people this. I said, when you're a heroin addict, you're screwed. I said, because you're always going to be in bondage. You're either going to be enslaved to the heroin or you're going to be enslaved to Suboxone, or you're going to be enslaved to these NA meetings and talking about, you know, and, and glorifying how, how many years sober you have, but you can't go a day without a meeting. You know, <laughs> like, I'm like, you're a slave no matter what. So I don't want to be a slave anymore, you know? Uh, so anyways, I uh, basically take the, the, you know, thing and tie it. And so I just stepped off. It was like, a, I just stepped and, and then the next thing I know, I'm, I'm, I, I, like my other foot slipped off and then I, and I fall. And, uh, I remember it caught me. And, and so the, the mic cord, you know, it catches me and it pulls tight. And as soon as I feel it, like actually hold my body weight and realize like, oh, you're not dropping anymore. I remember I said, oh, this was a big mistake. Like it was, it was immediate regret, immediate, like this isn't good. And no, like, cause I knew there's like, what am I gonna do? Like, there's nothing I could do right now. It's the middle of the night. It's like 12 o'clock at night. Um, and so next thing I know it's black, everything goes black. And then next thing I know I'm in a dreamlike state in my mind, but I still can't really see anything, but I'm freezing cold, the coldest I had ever been in my life. And I feel like I'm underwater. Like if, you know, you go underwater at the swimming pool, like that's how I feel. I feel like I'm in water, freezing cold, but in the dream, I can't breathe. So in the dream, I can't move or breathe. And I just feel like I'm floating around in water like an icicle. And then out of nowhere, out of like the left corner of my eye, I see this little beam of like light. It's very small. It wasn't like a big light. It was, it was a light. It was just enough of a light to grab my attention it starts moving towards me and gr- kind of getting bigger and it doesn't get too close. It gets maybe 15 feet away from me. And the next thing I know, I feel this, the rope, like, actually, I didn't even know it was a rope because I, I don't even know what's going on at this point. All of a sudden, whatever was on my neck, I feel it just loosen. And then I, I pull, I stand up and I'm in the water and now everything hits me, what had just happened. So now I'm like, like, it was like, I didn't know I did it. So I'm sitting there like, you, what just happened? What just happened? Like, I, I'm like grabbing the, the mic cord. I'm taking it off. I'm like walking over to the, um, to the, the side of the hill. I start, you know, I'm slipping down the hill. I'm crawling. I'm climbing up this little hill. I'm freezing my face off. It's, it's like the middle of December or January. And I run inside and I, I ran a bath. And I sat in the bath, I remember, and drank wine and cried for like an hour. And I'm sitting there like, because I'm in such shock that I actually did what I did. And I'm in such shock that like, that I'm still here and so grateful. So it's like this, this mixture of like, you know, like my whole entire life of frustration, gratitude, anger, regret, like all mixed in one. And I'm just a mess. And, um, what was interesting is I remember I went out the next day just, and just staring at the, like the spot, just like recollecting what had happened and i remember at that point was the first time in my life that i knew i had purpose that was the first time in my life where like i knew not like oh i feel like i have a purpose or like it was this internal solid uh like i know i have a purpose well i i feel like we're, we miss details because i don't under, really understand what happened so you stepped off the cliff with the rope tied around your neck and then you went into the stream state but what happened to the cord? Did the cord loosen from the top? Did it loosen from your neck? What what happened? How did you fall? And how did you end up in the river in the first place too? So, yeah, so that's what was, that's what was crazy. And that was really what led me to believe it was Angel that saved me. And, it, you know, that I had a purpose was that when I got out, I went up and the rope was, I figured that's what my first assumption was it untied from the fence. But I go up there and it's still, I, when I tied it from my neck, I just left everything that night. So the next day I go back. And the, the mic cord is still tied to the Civil War f- fence. So the length of the cord wasn't as long as the drop. It wasn't like, oh, I, you know, I, I stepped off and just fell into the, the, the river or whatever. It was, it, it caught me like halfway down the little drop. Um, so my only like logical thought is that it stretched. Um, 
because it was a it was attached to my neck and the post but i was still in the water and so th how i was in the water is because like i said it was it was a main stream and then basically this little cliff it had a little break off to a smaller stream and we're talking like creek size like small creek like two feet of water on a, if it rained so it was extremely like rocky that was the other thing is i didn't have any marks like i had i had no marks and I'm like, dude, I just fell 20 feet into the, like, it was, it was maybe 18 inches of water, two feet of water max and rocky edges. And the thing that was crazy was that the, from like the foot of the, the cliff to the water was like a good six feet. So I, like, it was like everything about it didn't make sense. Like nothing about it made any sense. Like, I'm like, how did I, I don't know how I ended up in the water. How did I not like bash my head open on the, on the jagged rocks at the bottom? How did I not? All I have is like deep purple marks around my neck, you know, and like I, I was sitting there wearing a scarf all the time, you know, <laughs> but um, so, yeah. Because the like a microphone cord is like probably an XLR cord where you're talking about Well, regardless, like it, even if it, it is or, or if it's a different kind of cord that you had, like these are like six feet long, usually six to eight feet long. So if you tie it around a fence post and you tie it around your neck, you even have less than that. It makes no sense that, that a cord like that would go all the way down. And I don't even know that these cords exist, honestly. I don't even know like that that XLR cables that long exist. So I understand why you felt some kind of purpose because looking back, not not looking back on the moment, literally looking back at the cord, you were like, this is impossible. Yeah, no, that was, I mean, that's why I didn't even look. The, the, that night, I just was like so caught up in the moment. But the next day, I was assume, like 100% sure I was going to walk out there and find the, the, the cord like on the side of the, the little cliff or something. And it's like, no, it's still just sitting there, just tied solid as I'd put it on there. So, so yeah, that, that's the only logical explanation is that it's stretched like double its, its length because, yeah, it might have been like an eight or 10 foot cord. Um, but, yeah. So with that, you also talked about it was the first time that you felt purpose. Before you mentioned you were, when you were coming down the drugs, you, you felt a sense of hopelessness that you, is hard to explain, but now you felt purpose. And soon after, there's something else that happened, but it's around that time that your life started to turn around. But another major point in that happening is when you went to jail again and you met somebody in that jail. Can you explain what happened in there? Yeah, so to save you guys, you know, the next five years or no, the next like three and a half, four years, basically the next three, four years was just the darkest, like even it got 10 times darker. You know, I was out for like two of those years. I was smoking PCP almost every day. I'm still on heroin. I'm doing these things. So it's getting darker. I'm having, I went to the doctor at one point, I'm, you know, I'm a, a prescribed Xanax. So I'm having, I had like four or five overdoses. It's just bad. It's just really bad. And so I get locked up for 18 months. And while I'm there, I remember I met an old friend that I knew from, you know, around the, the area. And he had been locked up already for like five years. And so when I went in there, I, he's the last person I was expecting to see. We were never super close, but we were, you know, we were, we would party together here and there. And uh, so, I, you know, I see him and I remember he was like the first night I was there, he led a Bible study. And I'm sitting in this Bible study like, is this a joke? You know, like, I'm like, I was just like shocked. He seemed like such a different person. Um, and I'm talking to him and, and he, he kept talking about Jesus. And I, like, I remember one, one night, like I snapped on him, like I'm trying to cook food. He's like talking about something and I'm like, bro, I don't want to hear it. Like, leave me alone, dude. Like, like I get it. That's cool. But like, just like be quiet, bro. I'm trying to make noodles. Like, you know, like, and, <laughs> Uh, he's talking to me about Jesus. I remember, and it was funny because I remember I told him my testimony of, of the, the suicide attempt. And I remember he stopped. He's like, you're here for something. God's got a purpose for, it. you know, he kind of was like sitting there and he's like, yeah, God's got a purpose for your life. Like, and so anyways, I saw that he was different and, you know, he, he still had, had his, his old self was still there, but he was definitely like where it grabbed my attention. He was, he was born again enough to where it grabbed my attention. And so that was like the first real like seed, I think, where I was like, Okay, maybe Jesus. I don't know, but I'm still sold out on like at this point. My ideology is anything you believe is the reality. If you believe it's Jesus, that's what it'll be. If you believe it's Krishna, that's what it's going to be. Whatever you believe, your mind is the the boss. So whatever you make believe, so so it'll be right. And so that's my idea at this point. But I, you know, the 18 months go by. When I get out, 
I remember I was like, I, I, I'm doing different this time. You know, like that was, I was so sincere of, at this point, my daughter's three and a half. Um, there's a crazy situation going on with her. Um, and just everything is not good, you know? So I'm like, all right, this is my time. I got a fresh start to re redo my life. And so I, I get out and I'm like, you know what, uh, I'm going to start going to church. And there's, you know, uh, this church I would go to, I was going like maybe two, three times a month, actually, you know, so I get out, I'm, I'm dead set on a new, new life. I'm going to start going to church. And at this point, I don't even know if I believe in Jesus. I just am open to Jesus. So at this point, it's like, sure, why not? If he shows up, that'll be cool. And if he doesn't, then, you know, I'm in the same boat. And so basically, I remember the first or second service I went to was a youth night thing. And, and the preacher lady called me up to the front and basically like makes me say it's in a prayer. You know? okay. uh, and like basically makes me say it. And I remember being like, just like just put me on the spot and just feeling awkward and and you know that was that was that and nothing happened i didn't feel the presence of god i didn't feel born again i didn't feel anything it was just like all right and went back to my seat but then what was crazy is i then had another time actually i've never shared this before i went so i went to another service one of the during this time and this they had a prophet there and he calls me up and he's like he's standing there and he's like God saved you from jail or, and this, he saved you from death. And he's saying stuff like that. He's like, you were, how many times have you been to jail? That was his first question. He said, how many times have you been to jail? I said like four or five times. He said, he said, God's, he's like, I see God saving you um, from gunshots. And he goes, he, he went like made the gun, uh, you know, shape and went like, boom, boom, three times. And I remember when he did it, it was almost as if I could feel these bullets hitting me. Like, and and it was so, it was powerful. Cause I remember like, feeling what he was saying and him just it was like he was seeing it happen and he said god's gonna deliver you from these gunshots and he's gonna save you because you know basically he's it was a warning word i don't remember the exact but it was basically that he's gonna save you from these things but you need to like give your life to him kind of thing it was like a warning right and so i remember that rocked me like to the point where i wrote it down in my journal and stuff like that was my first encounter with the supernatural within the christian world because before that, Christianity to me was just like, you don't drink alcohol, you don't cuss, and you, you know, go sing these pop songs at church. Like, that was my view of Christianity. Like, and so that was my first time with seeing the power of God. And so anyways, at that point, I started going to these churches, this church. Uh, and it was a time just to escape who I was, you know, but I'm still going to the club or the bars. I'm going to the bars. I'm still drinking. I'm blacking out, actually. The first, like, three weeks I was home, I'm blacking out, like, every night. And, you know, I'm still trying to hook up with girls, but I'm just trying, my only goal is to stay away from heroin. And so that was kind of what the next seven months I'd say looked like was me going to church, begging God to like help me, not know, not finding God, trying to find God. But then all of a sudden what happened was I started to feel bad about sleeping with the girl that I was dating at the time. And I started to feel bad about shooting up my Suboxone, which at, at that time, suboxone was a good thing for me like that was like you're doing a really good job if this is all you're doing is drinking and suboxone then you're like on the right path <laughs> you know and and i started to feel bad about it i started to feel bad about the suboxone and sleeping with my girl and it was crazy like i'm like why do i feel like because I, I would tell her like i don't think i should have sex so i'm married i didn't even know why i was saying that like i'm just like i don't think i'm supposed to like and she would laugh and be like yeah right and i would laugh too you know but in a way where i was like I was embarrassed that I was serious, you know, and, right. and, but internally I'd be like, no, I'm actually like really serious right now. I don't know what, what, where this is coming from. I didn't even know what it, that it was conviction. So that was kind of how it was those following months after. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Joshua, but if you want to know how he became an addict in the first place, then head over to Locals by clicking the link in the description. That's where we upload all types of exclusive content for you, the ones who are curious and want to know more about these stories. It's completely free to join, so why don't you come over and check out the wealth of content and insight that's available there? I'll be waiting for you. But until then, here's the rest of Joshua's story. You had a good little run for a while. When, like, in your words, you know, you thought you were doing good just on Suboxone. And, you know, uh, I think maybe drinking the other thing you were talking about. Um, I, but anyway, you were going to church and w when you were going to church, you felt better and it, it was decent for a little bit, but then you, you kind of slipped back into your old habits. Uh, but 
I don't know how to, to what extent. I don't know if it was as intense as before, but there was another you know, pivotal moment. And it's kind of like your whole story. There's a lot of pivotal moments. And that's why we're going through all these details, because I think they're important to talk about. But you got arrested again. And that time you you lost everything. And I think that was some sort of a wake up call for you. Can you explain what happened? Yeah. So about eight months after I had gotten out of jail, I was working to get my life back. And so I had gotten a restricted license, got a car. I had a decent job and I'm just taking, you know, my Suboxone. And uh, I think I also was taking Xanax as well. I had a prescription for Xanax, which I was abusing, but I had a prescription. So at the time I felt good about it. You know, I felt it was, it was explainable. And so anyways, but I'm doing like, I'm really working hard. I'm trying my best, like the hardest, the best I had ever been doing it up until that point. Right. And so basically I get a, a, a basement apartment that I'm renting out this real huge, nice room in this nice house. And, um, things are coming together. So it was like, you're, I was building all this stuff up. I think I'm doing so good. I'm trying so hard. And then within like three weeks, everything was gone, everything. And I was like, at that point though, I was so I guess broken my discouraged. I didn't even really care to be honest. Like I was pretty numb at that point in life that I didn't really care. I, like when I, I was like, cool, I know where all the homeless people stay. I'll get a tent. I'm good. Uh, take me back to the woods. I don't care anymore. So I was working at a TGI Fridays and then in the woods behind it, I had a, a camp where I, a homeless camp. It was like six of us. We'd stay back there. I'd go to work and, and get out of the jail and go get go. As soon as I walked out the, the my job, I'd hand all my cash I made to this this guy and get drugs and go in the, the camp and, and get high, you know, and that was like what I did for the next, I don't know, like month. And um, basically the girl I was still dating this girl at this time. I don't know, you know, what she was doing. But anyway, she her mom would talk to me about Jesus and she'd be like, you're just in spiritual warfare. She's like, you know, like she's trying to be supportive of me, but also like look out for daughter. So she doesn't want me with her, but she's being loving towards me. And she was like, you, you need to find Jesus, you know, it's spiritual warfare. And I remember like, I would try to like pretend like I kind of did believe in Jesus. So she would like me more, you know? Uh, but I was serious. Like, I'm like, dude, I did Jesus. What do you mean? Like I called on you. I'm, I'm praying to Jesus every day. Like, please don't let me do this. Please don't let me like, please stop me. Please help me. Nothing's happening. Like y'all like nothing. So I'm getting mad. Cause I'm like, Jesus isn't helping me. He don't care about me. I don't think, you know? And, uh, and I remember one day I'm at work and this lady comes up to me and she's like, God says you need to see him. And at that point I had stopped going to church for like two or three months. I stopped going. And I said, yeah, I know I need to see him. I said, I need to see him. Like, how do I see this guy? You know, like, and, uh, I, but it was something that stuck to me. Cause I was like, man, I knew it was God. Like at that time, like I knew, I, I knew it was something more to it. It wasn't just some random lady saying some random thing. Like I knew I was like, yeah, I know I do need to see him. So I remember I went to an AA meeting like two days later, a week later or something. And I, something led me to get out of the meeting and go to the chapel. So I'm in the chapel and I just stand there like before the, the, you know, the, the stage and everything. And I'm just like, here I am, Lord. You know, I mean, it's like uh, this moment where I'm like, you said you want to see me here. I am like, what's going on. And I remember I just like stand there for like five minutes, sit down on one of the pews, I'm like, all right, open the Bible. I read this little page. Just read this one little, op that whatever I open to, read it. Go back to my, my thing or whatever. Like a week later, I do the exact same thing, the exact same way. And I sit back down, read the thing. And halfway through it, I'm like, dude, I read this before. And I'm like, I don't read the Bible. Like, I'm like, this was exact same thing I just read last time. Like, what are the chances of me opening up to the exact same scripture? Like, and I, you know, I'm like, this is me. Like, this is what I'm going through right now. And I remember like I sent it the girl's day and she's like, what does that have to do with you? I'm like, what do you mean? This is everything. Like I'm, I'm entangled by death. Like, you know, like I'm like telling her this verse, like best I can. And, um, and then a couple of days later, you know, now it's like getting more real, uh, what's happening. And, uh, there was this point where basically my, my dad invited me to go with him to go see my grandma. Cause she was, she was sick. And so he was like going to see her and she, she had this, she has ALS at the time. And um, he's like, you want to come, you know, with me and come see her. So I go out there for this weekend and basically, uh, you know, I, I go get my dad one of them after like we spend time with the family for a while. I'm like, well, let me go. I want to go out to the bar or something. So he takes it, drops me off at one of the bars. And uh, I meet this guy, of course, within like five minutes who's selling, you know, 
uh, you know, E and pills and weed and stuff. And, and so I, you know, I'm drinking, I'm taking, uh, I think I took an E pill or something. And anyways, I'm laying in my, my bed, I get back home, I'm laying there. Now, mind you, I'm not even like, I'm like pretty much sober for, for me. Like I'm sober. I'm not like, I'm, I'm content. I'm chilling. And I'm laying in the bed and I'm watching American Pickers. My uncle's laying next to me. It was a, it was basically two couches and then a mattress in the, that held them together. Right. So it was like, we're laying there. I'm watching American Pickers. I'm trying to go to sleep and I'm closing my eyes. And all of a sudden the TV changed into demonic voices. So I'm hearing the, the American Picker guys, they're sitting there talking, but their voices shift into that like deep demonic type of voice. And then they started talking about me. And so I'm like, when, when you do drugs, you know, when it's the drugs, when it's not like, that's, that's all I can say. Like I was completely fine. Next thing I know this thing happens. I hear the TV turn into demonic voices they are talking about me. They say, his name is Josh. We need to destroy him. And then I, all of a sudden I feel that familiar feeling of, of, of sleep paralysis. And I feel like something's trying to get in my body. So I feel myself going into sleep paralysis. I'm not even asleep. I'm not even close to being asleep. I'm fighting that like it feels like a worm or something's trying to slither in me. I'm fighting this thing, but I can't like move. I'm paralyzed kind of. And I'm trying to scream. And next thing I know, I like come to to myself on the floor screaming. And I had woken up my dad and my grandmother. They're on the top of the stairs, like, what is going on? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm good, I'm good. I just I just had a weird dream and fell off the bed or something, right? And I, I lay back down. But this time when I laid back down, now this voice is telling me to kill my uncle. So now I'm laying in, in, in this place and I'm like, what? I'm like, dude, I don't want to kill my uncle. Like, you know, I'm sitting here like arguing with this voice in my head, but it's like very strong. And it's very, it's like, it's like, no, no you're going to do, and it's telling me that you're just going to get up and you're just going to crush his head. Like just squeeze, squeeze his head and pop it. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, and I'm like, but while I'm arguing with this voice, I find my body actually getting out of the bed and actually standing up. And I'm literally, I find myself standing over my uncle. And my hands are like slowly going towards his head. Like I could, like I could just pop it or something. And, uh, so I'm like this and all of a sudden I see his eyes just pop open. Like right when I'm about to touch him and his eyes pop open, he's obviously freaked out and he's like, what are you doing? Like, and he gets up and like goes like somewhere else. And I lay back down and, and I kind of doze off. And so I come back to the camp. Now this is like a week later, I, you know, and I'm with these guys that were, were smoking K2. And, you know, I had smoked K2 when it first came out and I hated it. But I remember these guys would be so out of their minds. It intrigued me because I'm like, dude, there's no way y'all are like, this is this stuff is nothing. What are you guys, you know, and they would be like out their minds, like acting weird. And so I was like, there's no way this stuff gets you guys, gets people high like this. So they're like, this stuff does, like it has this and th whatever, like, and so they're like, uh, don't hit it more than like once or twice. And so I hit it a few times. And, uh, basically I remember there was this moment where I was like, oh, wow. And I feel this like kind of wave come over me. I, f I feel myself falling out and I hear them like he's falling out. And so I fall over and I basically start crawling towards this tent. And I, um, I'm like, I'm, I'm crawling towards my tent while I'm like going out and next day I know I'm out. And then I find myself standing, like standing in this random place. It wasn't, and this was so interesting because it wasn't even like a dream. This, this, this overdose or whatever it even was, was not like a dream. It was like nothing I had experienced before. It was like all of a sudden I was just in another place and I was just standing at this place. And when I looked, there's demons like standing in a line like they made. A, it was like a hallway and they're on both sides of this hallway. Like and they had these brown robes. Some of them are short. Some of them are tall, ugly demons, like something you'd see in a movie. These weird looking, just deformed. They almost look human, but they're not. They're they're monstrous. They're hideous. They have these big grins. They're all standing there facing each other, but they're like looking at me like they're excited to see me. And but I'm so I'm so kind of uh, captivated by what I'm seeing that I'm just walking. And I don't know why I'm walking or why I'm walking. I'm just like looking, and I'm walking. And then I realized I was following another one that was in front of me, and it's like leading me to this door. And it's this big like golden door, and it's leading me to this door. And it but when we get to it it stops and it it's as it's turning to look at me it says one more step you're almost there and it turns and it has this big grins teeth are up here like this 
And I said, oh, hell no. And I turn around and uh, I wake up and I'm in a pool of sweat, like just drenched sweat. Um, so now all these things are happening to where I know I'm in a spiritual battle, but I don't know what to do or what's going on. You know, it's like when you don't know Jesus or you don't know like what like you I just felt like I was in this war, like a tornado of like dude, what is happening to my life? What is going on? Like, it, it just was this whirlwind of like one thing after another. It's like, dude, I couldn't come up with this type of like chaos if I tried. It was like, what is going on, dude? It's like something is trying to destroy me. You know, it's like, um, it's one thing after another. And so, okay, let's recap because I want to make sure that we get the timeline right. So the time that you went to, I don't know if it was your uncle's house or, or somebody else's house, you stayed there for like a weekend, right? And that's when that, happened with your uncle right and then you came back to you said you came back to the camp yeah uh and you did k2 you had this and you said you you od'd so somehow you knew and i also want to mention this is important this was not your first time you know ODing. yeah you, this was like your fourth or fifth time you you knew what this felt like obviously not always on the same drugs but you felt like this was different than than just a regular od right yeah and see and that's the thing i don't even think it's i don't even know if it's possible to o overdose on k2 like actual like uh die from it i had had like four uh overdoses on heroin and xanax one of them in which i was hospitalized for and all of them were just like I went to sleep and didn't know and woke up, you know, like, so there was nothing to it. This was different than any, like, cause this, it was like, I was slowly watching myself leave, but I 100% was out. Like, I mean, I was incapacitated out. So whatever happened, it was, I, I call it an overdose. Cause it definitely wasn't like some just normal high or something. It wasn't like, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, then, then that happened. Okay, so so right before that happened, you said you had been three months uh, so clean, pretty much. Is that what you, what well, you were saying? Well, I had been off the the dope, so at, at, like that was the only thing I was clean from. Really, was the heroin. I was taking Suboxone. I was okay. smoking, shooting crack, and weed and drinking. But um, yeah, I had been like that was my only goal was like just don't do heroin. It was like my that's right. Okay, and then a week after, or you know, more or less after that in K two experience overdose, like you called it then something else happened and you were about to get into that. Right, right. So this is maybe a week or so after. And, you know, this girl that I was with at the time is like trying to talk me out about going to rehab and stuff. She's like, you need to go to rehab. And, and she's trying to talk me into a rehab. And so I basically told her like, look, I'm going to go get some heroin tonight and then drop me off tomorrow at the detox. And I'm going to go to the detox center. Uh, all right. So basically my idea was, yeah, like every other addict's like, yeah, that one more, one more time. And so I went and got some, you know, I got like a half a gram, which at the time, you know, like wasn't stuff that had this fentanyl and all that stuff in there. But um, at the time, like a half a gram when I was using was like something I could do at once kind of thing when I was doing it daily. But at this point, I hadn't done it for a few months. So I had this whole like half a gram and I was like, all right, um, I know if I do all of this at once, I could probably like overdose. Like it's a, there's a good chance I could. Um, but if I, if I break it in half or don't do it all, then I don't think I can do, it's not enough to get me high. Like I want to get twice. So it's kind of like, uh, I'm just going to gamble with it. I think I could just do it all. So I wasn't trying to overdose. I wasn't trying, but I knew that there was a good chance I was. Um, so I, I remember though, I, but again, like I was, I was broken at this point, completely like shattered. Like I, I, I all I wanted like I can't stress it. it was like, all I wanted was to be free and to live life like so bad. like. And the pain of causing pain was the worst. Like the the pain of not being able to. It was like to feel like you were so out of control of your own life is a, is a scary thing. It's a crappy feeling to like want to do good. Like Romans seven, like I want to do good so bad. And like and I and to be honest with you, like I was a decent person as far as like I I cared about people. I tried to look out for people that I could. I like I tried to be a decent person. It wasn't like I was just like hateful, like raging maniac. Like I just had this addiction that I could not shake. And I hated myself for it. And and so anyways, like I just remember I was like, dude, I'm so sick of everything, dude. Like, I, like this has been, you know, at this point, it had been five years since my suicide attempt. This was like the first time in my life that I felt that close to wanting to die again. You know what I mean? And and so I remember I'm sitting there in the bathroom and I I, I was looking at all the drug the drugs and the needle and stuff. And I said, I'm done. I said, God, I've been calling on you all year. I said, you don't do anything. You haven't helped me. 
I said, I went to the church. I did the prayers. I'm talking to God. Like I'm having this moment of pouring my heart to God. And I'm like, you know, I did everything I could. I said, I don't know what else you want from me. I said, this is all I know for 12 years. This is all I've ever done. This is all I know. What do you expect from me? I know I'm wrong. Sorry. I don't know how to stop. You know, I'm going in and, and, and I said, this is it. And so I, I you know, d- to do my tie, I load the needle and, and I said, uh, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And, and I'd say the prayer and, and I pushed the plunger. And I remember that if, if when in times that I've overdosed before, there's this split second moment of knowing, like you, it's almost like you feel the entire drug just take over. Like it's this, this weight of like, oh, I'm going to overdose. There's that split second knowing. And I felt that, and I remember I went into like fight or flight, and I I said run, and I stood up and ran out the bathroom, and next thing I know I'm in the ambulance, and so I wake up in the ambulance, and they're basically telling me what happened. I already knew what happened. Um, they're like, yeah, somebody called. We like we don't even know who called. They're like, you're just laying out there on the third floor, just up there, and um, and so I you know I go to jail. They basically take me to jail for possession, and I go into the holding cell. Uh, the the uh, they put me on suicide watch basically because I told the cop, I said, dude, you should just let me die, bro. Like, why did you, I said, I'm on probation, man. I said, I, so I'm like, man, why did you, you know, he's like, oh, you're suicidal too. Okay. We'll let them know. (laughs) And that was like his way of, you know, being a jerk really, but maybe it helped save me. But anyways, uh, you know, as I go and I'm in a suicide watch. And so basically what that means is they take like the slightest comforts you have in jail, like a blanket, like, you know, like the basics, like a, actually like a, a lunch box <laughs> and they take that. And so you don't have water to your cell. You, I mean, they take everything and you're wearing this. It's like an oven mitt. It's a material like an oven mitt and it's just like a poncho. That's all you have in there. So I'm freezing cold. I'm going through withdrawals. I'm there for five days. I remember I look on the wall and it said someone wrote uh, cold hell. Um, cold hell on the wall. I remember I would stare at that and be like, dude, this, this really is cold hell. Like I was withdrawing off all types of different things. I'm just, it was hell on earth. Like literally the most uncomfortable I'd ever been in my entire life. I'm kicking in this place for five days, crying out to Jesus, saying that our father prayer like 50 times in a row, uh, just to make the discomfort like 1% better. Um, and then I remember at one point I took, I had a phone call. I think it was like the first or sec- the second day. And uh, I called my mom and she's a mess. She's like, you overdose again, Josh. She's like, are you happy? You always died again. And she's crying. She's like, you know, like, and I remember that was like, I felt something hit me. Like my heart, like, you know, I felt uh, remorse and I just felt bad. And it was like, you know, because I'm going through these withdrawals, I'm having to face everything. I can't numb any of it. And I'm just sitting in this cell going through hell. And it was like God put every problem, every mistake, every issue, everything I ever done in, in that in my entire life and threw it in a big pile and put it in that room with me. And I'm just sitting there for five days looking at my mess of a life. And I said, God, I I don't know if you're real, if any of this, all I know is that like, I just want to be a good boy. That was my prayer. I said, I don't like, I'm not even praying to get out of this. I'm hoping I don't do more in like five years. And I'm hoping that, you know, I just want to be a good boy. That's it. I said, God, I won't go to the bars anymore. I don't even want to drink anymore. I said, I don't even want to have sex anymore. I said, I just want to be a good boy. That was my prayer. Um, and so then I get out of there five days later, they, they put me in the, the pod where, you know, you hang out basically. And in this pod, uh, it's like, there's nothing to do. You know, it's like, it's like you got different groups. You got people that sit there and watch TV all day. You got people that play cards all day and games all day. You got people that sit there and just talk about their days being a drug dealer and how they're going to, all the girls they had, you know, intercourse with and, and plan what they're going to do. And like, yeah, bro, when we link up, we're going to get, you know, you know, so it's like, that's your option or sit in your cell. And so I remember I walked out there and I just stood on the little terrace thing on my floor looking at everybody. And I remember I said, dude, I'm not doing this again. Like I, like I didn't know how or what, or and I said, I am not doing this again. Like I just did this for 18 months. I haven't even been home a year. I said, I'm not doing this again. It's not happening. I don't care how, what, why, like I'm not sitting in this place. And I went over to the front desk and I said, what kind of like don't like what kind of activities like what kind of dorms you know they have like a drug dorm or a, a, so i said let me go to the mind dorm because i heard it they'll get you in there fast so I, i'm like what is the mind dorm? Like, they're like it's a christian program bro he's like you can't cuss people are trying to talk me out of it i said i do not care bro i do not i'm not sitting here with you guys i'm going to this dorm and so i go to the dorm and 
I remember it was like weird at first, you know, because it was just it was just a different vibe. It's like you went from like jail jail to like everyone was kind of more calm. Like they're playing Christian music. Uh you had to wake up early, you know, there's like these little rules, but people were kind of like people are sharing their food in there. And I'm like, you know, it's just like a different world for the jail life. Um and so that was kind of where it began. I don't know if that's what you want me to get into, I guess, right? The the how that all happened of my encounter with Jesus. Actually, before going there, I want to ask, because you didn't touch on it, but your daughter, you had a daughter. And last time I heard about your daughter in this conversation is when she was three. But what happened with her? Because I imagine, you know, with all the jail time and times getting arrested, she probably was pulled from you. What happened and when did that happen? Just so we have an idea. So for the better part of the first 18 months of her life, um, she lived with me and, my, and I lived in my dad's basement and her mom lived with, with me as well. So we all lived together for the first like 18 months. So my daughter's like 18 months at that point. So the next 18 months, till so she was about like three, we were on and off. It's like, you know, we would try to make it work for like a week and she'd come live with me for like a week. And then I wouldn't see her for a couple of weeks and her mom would kind of you know, like drop her off, like when she needed someone to watch her, like she'd let me see her when, when it was convenient for her. And then it was like, you know, but I'm just getting high. I'm, I'm not a good dad. That's for sure. You know, I'm not handling my responsibilities. And so I didn't really get to see her. It was like here and there. And so that, at that point, that's how it was. Um, and so at this point, she, my daughter was like five, five and a half. Okay. So let's go back to your time in jail. Uh, because I think you were about to get into the story of what happened in that group. Uh, it seemed to be when you finally got freedom from all the things you were looking for. Um, how did that unfold? So it started, it was really interesting. There was a friend that I was going to move in with, right? Like the week or two before uh, I went to jail, we were, t- we were hanging out and he's like, yeah, you can move in with me and my girlfriend. We got this room. And he disappeared. Like I was, I had the money. I was like, yeah, I'm going to move it. And he disappeared. And so I already knew he kind of went and got locked up. So I walk into this dorm and sure enough, he's my bunk mate. You know, like I go to my bed and he's sitting there. I'm like, well, I guess we're still roommates, you know? And, uh, I remember like a weekend I was about to leave cause I'm, I'm detoxing. I was sick for a whole month. I couldn't sleep. I'm just withdrawing. It was terrible. So boxing withdrawal is not a game. And so I told him, I said, bro, they're waking us up early. I said, that's like, I'm in jail. I'm not trying to be up at seven o'clock in the morning. I'm not trying to be here all day. You know, I'm trying to sleep this thing away as much as I can. And he's like, bro, I know. He's like, just stay, bro. He's like, I'm trying to tell you. Like, he's like, there, you'll find peace in this place, you know? And he's like, it's just, just give it a chance. So he tells me that. And, and then I had this like voice telling me like, why don't you just try? There was something telling me like, just try like this internal thing, like, I said, you're right. Where else am I going to go? I'm going to go back to the another jail, the other side of jail, so I could sleep in a couple hours maybe and, you know, lay in bed longer. And so I said, all right. So I started reading the Bible. Someone, oh, this is what was crazy. This, so this is at, around that time. I'm sitting on my bed. There was a time where, like, you had to sit on your bed. It was locked down. So we'd have to sit on our beds, but it was a dorm. So you weren't in the cell, but we, were, we weren't allowed to sleep. As like It was like, you need to do something productive while you're sitting there. So this guy comes up and he's like, you want a Bible? He's on the bed next to me. I said, yeah, sure. He gives me a Bible. I open it. What do you think I open it to? Straight to Psalm 18. So now this is three times I'm opening to Psalm 18. At that point, I said, dude, God's real. Like, I don't know what, I don't know about if he likes me. I don't know if he wants me. I don't know how to talk to him, but this is too weird. This is crazy. This is the third time now. So what started happening is I started reading the Bible and being serious, uh, speakers would come in. I would listen. Uh, I just started putting my focus on on Jesus, and not the conversations after Jesus. You get what I'm saying? Like after the the meetings in the Bible time, everyone else is playing games, watching TV. I started to have this internal hunger to read the Bible when I didn't need to. So it was like it went from like, yeah, this is what you have to do during this time, to like this is a really crazy story. You know what I'm saying? And I actually want to keep finding out what happens and reading. And all of a sudden, I'd say like a week and a week or two after that, somebody came up to me actually. And they said, something happened to you. He's like, you, you seem different. He's like, you just like, he's like, he seems like you changed over this past like week. And I didn't even really register it. I was just like, I don't know. I mean, I'm getting off the drugs, you know? And 
internally though something was changing and uh, i knew the day i knew that something changed that was serious like a, a something significant was i was sitting at the table with these guys and they were talking about some you know they were talking about some stupid some girls or something i don't know what they were talking about i don't remember but i went to make a dirty joke and the joke was something that i would have normally said and when i said it i felt my inside sink like i felt i felt my heart sink I felt so convicted. I felt stupid, but it wasn't funny to like, and everyone, no one laughed or anything. And I was just sitting there like, what is happening to me? Like, and <laughs> so I was like, all right. I, and I, I went with that. I left kind of, and was like, all right. And went back to what I was doing. But I, I remember I just started feeling this internal joy. I started feeling this blossoming something. So like, I remember particularly one night I'm laying on my bed and I would feel my heart. It felt like it was getting crushed. It was almost like I could feel myself getting a new heart. Like it would, I would get these like heart pains and chest palpations, but it was like life. I, I can't explain it. It was like, I, I just, every like couple of days, I would notice that I was more happy. I had more hope. And every time I prayed, I started to feel, honestly, I, I was like praying, like I was taking, you know, like a drug or something. Like I would pray and I would feel like this boost of like energy and like euphoria almost. And just like, so it was like Jesus became like this, like this relief for my pain while I was in the jail. He became this escape. So now I'm like, dude, I'm not talking to any all. I'm putting, you know, they had a computer where they had some music. I'm like, I'm listening to, you know, Jesus uh, culture and I'm sitting there like jamming and feeling, you know, the presence of God. And I'm, you know, I'm like, I, I, it was instant. It was like, like once I started feeling the tangible presence of God, I would like pray for people and they'd start crying. And I'm like, dude, this is real. I'm like, this is re like, I'm having, I, I know this God now. <laughs> so it's like, and then the crazy thing is I'm still withdrawing. I'm still dope sick, but I feel happier than I ever felt in my life. My mom came to visit me. She's like, the lawyer said, you're not going to bond. You're looking at three, three to five years. Old. And I said, praise God. <laughs> you know, like, so now everything shifted to where I'm like, I don't even care, dude, what happens to me. I don't care if I have to sit in this jail. I don't care what goes on, but I prayed. And I was like, you know, like, Look, now I know God, you know, like at that point, I remember I watched the movie, The Holy Ghost one day. This is about a month and a half in. I watched the movie. I'm on fire for God at this point. It's all I want to do. Read the Bible, talk about Jesus, pray. That's it. And I'm annoying the people in there, you know, because it's like I'm I'm locked in this box, but I want to evangelize. So I'm like talking to the same people like <laughs> 10 times about Jesus. And uh, and so I watched the, the movie. Uh, Holy Ghost, and uh, and I saw them praying for people on the street, and they would like be like, "Yeah, I feel the presence of God." And I remember it was like every cell of my being lit on fire, dude. It was like I was like, "This is what I'm here for." Like this, like it was like everything came together and clicked. And I was like, "Dude, this is it. This is it." So I went back to my bunk and I said, "Jesus, I said you don't have to get me out of here. You don't owe me anything." But I was like, "If you do get me out of here, I'm praying for every person I see." I was like, "I'm all in." whatever you want. Like, I'm your guy. I'll do it. You know? And that was kind of how it went. And, um, like, dude, w within a few days, my lawyer comes in, he's like, and it was exactly what I prayed. I said, if you can't get me out of here, God, I want a Christian halfway house. My lawyer comes in. I don't know how, you know, this happened, but we got approved for a bond for a bed to bed transfer for a Christian halfway house, this Christian halfway house, <laughs> exactly as I prayed for. And I said, all right. And so, the day that I went to court, it was the first time leaving that dorm. So it was like, I was locked in this room. It was almost this Holy Ghost, like, you know, tomb or something for two months I'm in there. And that was all I knew. And then I come out and I'm like going back to general population for court. And, and so we're in court, like, it was like 11 guys in my cell with a holding cell and they're talking and I'm like culture shock. Like, I'm like, Jesus, uh, I don't want to talk to these guys about this stuff. Cause all they're talking about is guns and drugs and all that stuff. And so I stood up and I was like, Hey guys, I was like, you're all about to go to court. Like, don't you think we should pray about this? You know? And, and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, Let's pray. So we all come around, they all huddle around and we, and I start praying, you know, it's crazy. As soon as I prayed, dude, after that, the conversation completely shifted. Nobody was talking about guns and drugs. They were talking about like, one of the guys is talking about God. They're talking about family. Like the comp the conversation completely shifted. Then one of the kids is talking to me. He has like 10 felony charges. This kid's like not getting out. He has like dr drug charges, gun charges on top of gun charges, like not getting a bond. No way. And I'm talking to him. He wants, he's like, I'm like talking about Jesus. I'm telling him my testimony basically. 
I'm like, you want to receive Jesus, bro? Like, this is real, dude. He will help you. I'm telling you, like, and I, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to get out of here, you know? And, and so he prays his prayer. He's crying. Like, we go to the court. Every single person in there gets a bond except for me. <laughs> so it was like, it was this funny moment because I'm like, I didn't get my bond, but everyone else did. And it was like this really cool moment because I'm sitting in the cell knowing I'm staying, but this kid is bawling, like crying, hugging me because he's thanking me. He's like, dude, thank you, bro. And I'm, I'm like, dude, that's none. It's Jesus. But he's like, thanks. I get to go see my family. It was the day before Christmas. So they all get to go home for Christmas. And I was so, I remember feeling so happy because I was like, dude, I'm so happy that other people got to go home for Christmas. And, um, and I knew my time was coming. And then it was, it was like the, the day after I, I got to get out like two days later. Um, and so after that, it was the start of, I guess, my whole journey with Jesus. <laughs> I want to circle back to something that you talked about in the very beginning. When you got into Buddhism, you felt some kind of presence. You felt some kind of spiritual thing happening, even though you weren't seeing anything. And then, you know, we talked about earlier how it seemed like doors would open and you would like get up to the next level. And it was always a, a level of misery. It, it was another level of depravity, of misery, of hopelessness until you open the door to Jesus. And then it seemed like these levels would kind of walk back. Like you would walk with levels of hope instead. And then you started reading the Bible and that was another door that opened more. And you started, you know, getting your life together after that, that time when you were genuinely reaching out to God. And, and it's just a, a testimony to how real the spiritual world is even if we can't see it. Now you got glimpses here and there when you were on drugs. Uh, and, and some people get glimpses on drugs. Other people get gl glimpses, you know, when they're sober. But, but you did have these glimpses. But more importantly, I think you felt inside, you felt a shift. Mm -hmm. And the people on the outside could only observe what was happening, but you knew inside what was going on. And you had been going through an amount of, you know, shifting to different beliefs was that time different than the other ones for example when you got into buddhism or when you got into new age and these kinds of things like what was different about this oh so different uh the one of the best ways i explain it is like when i thought about the happiest times of my life i would think about like either like a time i did mushrooms or a time i was tripping and i would feel connected to everything and i'd feel so full of like joy in life or or a time that like you know everything was good i had a bunch of money in my pocket and i had the girl i wanted to hook up with in my car and was going to like go do something fun and like that feeling of the wind in the window or you know what i'm saying like those were, th were things i would think of for genuine joy or happiness like no nothing trumped those but when I encountered the joy that I was experiencing with Christ, I realized, I was like, dude, I was never happy in my entire life. Like, I didn't even know what real peace was. I didn't even know what real joy was. They were like pale in comparison. Like that type of joy that I experienced before with the Buddhism and stuff, it was like these moments of like, okay, this is good. Um, it was like this pouring out, something came upon me that was good and made me feel warm like a blanket versus when I had this thing with Jesus, it felt like something was coming from within me. Like life switched from this sucks, that sucks, like, like to everything had a purpose. So that was one of the other big things for me is that I started to view bad things good. Like I started to see hard things and be thankful for them instead of being pissed off by them. So I would see like hardships that, I mean, my life got way harder once I got out. You know, it wasn't like some, it, it's been harder. Um, but when I got out in the jail, to the halfway house, it was nothing but but issues and, and problems. And, and I remember I would see them and I would pinpoint, that's what was crazy. Like you tracing it back to these things. It's like, I would pinpoint them and I, I'd notice it and be like, dude, this is right here, this situation right here, this exact thought, this, like, I would, I would think back to my old life and be like, this was when I would relapse right here. Boom. I'd, I'd point it out and be like, right now, this type of situation would have had me leaving this rehab and going and getting a bottle or something, going and getting drunk, finding some drugs right here, right now. And I said, no, we're not doing that this time. And I would see it. I'd say, I'm picking on my cross. I'm picking on my cross. And I'd keep going. And so it was like, I was seeing these, like the, the traps, like every enemy, every trap the enemy would lay in my life. I started seeing them and I would go right by them. 
And and every time I did, that internal joy would grow. Every time I would deny myself or not give in to something that I would have in the past, I would feel Jesus like pat me on the back and like reward me with something eternal, something inside of me. You know what I mean? And so that just fed my love for him. It fed my desire for him. And it just kind of fed the idea that um, like everything I was doing involved him and had a purpose. Um, So that was the biggest thing, like Buddhism and everything else. It's like, it didn't give me that effect. It gave me this like, um, and like, you only have peace as long as you can own, you know, like you only have peace Mm -hmm. as long as you meditate. You only have peace. Like you have to constantly be like plugging yourself. It's no different than a drug. You know, it's like, it's it's the same type of thing. Like you have to constantly be in this state and be, you know, it was just like, I I was trying so hard to like get it and it didn't even work. You know, it was like, it didn't free me, you know? Well, one thing about your story as well that I think is fascinating is that a lot of people now say, you know, this is your truth. You know, this worked for you, but, but it wasn't just working for you. It was working for you, but also the people around you. You talked about the people in, uh, in jail, you know, before the courtroom and how this man was touched. And as well, you know, I mentioned your daughter because I think it's actually important to circle back to you know, what happened with her a- after the case, because your daughter as well, her life was changed. So it, it wasn't just you. It was the the lives of the people around you. It wasn't just your truth. It was the truth of everybody you could touch that these things would happen. But what happened with your daughter after you you got clean and you, you were you know in relationship and loving Jesus the way that you explained? Yeah, no, Gabriel, that's a good point. Like that, that, and that was actually one of the huge things that really like secured it even more was that it wasn't just this personal thing. It was like other people were being affected by it and I was seeing it and and I knew it wasn't me. Um, but it made me feel like I, I, I finally, like, like my whole life I wanted to do good, you know, like my whole life I wanted to like serve people and do some good for the world, you know, like, and so I finally felt like I was doing that, um, serving my purpose. And so anyways, uh, after that, I was in a halfway house in Maryland for five months. I remember my daughter came out with her mom to come visit me and her grandmother. Probably like f- three months into it, they came out to visit and take me to the mall. So it was the first time I saw my daughter in probably six months or something. So that was cool. But then after that, I came home. I was in a halfway house again. So I was there for five months in Maryland. Then I moved back to Virginia, but I was in another halfway house uh, for a whole year. And so for that whole year, I couldn't obviously have my daughter live with me because she was... Uh, at that point, she was living with her grandfather. So the the grandfather on the mom's side had gotten custody of her when she was like five and a half. But then around 2019, uh, 20, I started like, I, I got to the place where I was basically like, all right, I think I'm ready to like have her live with me now. You know, like she can live with me full time. She was about eight at the time. And, and, uh, and so I started asking him to, I, I let him know that. And once I told him I was interested in getting custody, he started like keeping her from me. And I remember I was like, dude, I don't, I don't even get mad at all. I, I just would pray and just whatever. And so then I went through a season of not being able to see her. And so I remember praying like uh, intensely one weekend. I think I was fasting and praying about it. And I had this vision where God showed me a, a court case and the grandfather quit like in the before the court case even began he stood up and was like i'm done i quit like you 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 have her because he it was just he was like fighting me it was like he was competing with me to try to like you know what i'm saying and um and so i remember i took him to court and that's like, literally exactly what happened Ex- how, exactly how i saw it in my vision exactly what happened like right before the court case started he stood up and he's like you know what he's like you 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 can have her she go live with you that's fine because he was trying to do this you know competition thing and guilt her into staying with him and all this weird stuff and um and so she came and lived with me and at that point it was really exciting obviously at this point I was married um and I was excited uh however when she started living with me I noticed that there was so much stuff going on like she would have these men- breakdowns and these like these episodes uh like she didn't want to take a shower didn't want to you know like just little things she didn't want to go to sleep she didn't want to sleep by herself she wouldn't because she's used to sleeping with with you know him and it's like all these weird things that were like coming up to where i started to realize that there was a lot to i guess deal with and then um i remember i had a prayer room and then she had her own room and so my prayer room was like uh 
you know, I would, I would pray in there and there was a bed in there though. And so she, she started wanting to like sleep in that room only, you know, and I didn't understand, I didn't understand why at first, but she would like, she would lay in there and I would just worship God for like an hour. I would just, I would forget, I would put my hand on her, like it'd be like, it's bedtime. And I'd put my hand on her and I would just worship God and I'd get lost in the presence of God. And then she'd be asleep. And so after I did that for a while and over like four or five months, everything started changing. Like she started, you know, all the showering hygiene stuff was gone. The, the panic attack things were gone. She'd sleep by herself gone. Like it, so all of those things started fading away and it was, just, it felt like I was like just getting, you know, getting somewhere with, within that. And, you know, she's lived with me ever since. And that's uh 2000 to the last, you know, four and a half years or so uh, that she's lived with me. That's awesome. Yeah. God really restored your life even better than what it was in the first place because you were dealing with these things. We started when you were seven, seven, eight, and you were dealing with you know this darkness already. Not obviously not to the same extent as as you know your later years, but and then that all kind of got restored to a healthy level. I'm I'm so happy for you. But I, I want to ask because I think there's a lot of lessons to be taken from your testimony. Obviously, you've gone through so much. You definitely have lessons that you've taken from it. But in hindsight, I want to ask: Can you explain? what the drugs did to you. Now, I'm not really talking about the physical level because we all know that, you know, we know it ruined your life. It took all these things away from you. But I I mean, more spiritually, what do you think that drugs did? So basically, I mean, I could go, we could do a whole episode on this, but, uh, but in short, drugs are just a, it's like you go to the store and you buy a drink, you know, you, you give them a couple of dollars, they give you the drink. It's drugs are the devil's way of you buying, renting out peace. That's what it is. One milligram at a time, you're just renting out that piece. You're coming to the devil, you're cutting a little piece of your soul off, you're handing it to him and he's handing you a pill so you can get through the day. And and it's one day at a time, one high at a time, you're just cutting little pieces of your soul off, just handing it away. And so after long enough, you look in the mirror and you realize that you don't know who you are anymore. You look in the mirror and you just see an empty shell of a person. And the only way to even have any character traits is to to go put a needle back in your arm and, and just, you know, and then when you even do that, it gets to the point where you're still not even yourself at all, but you're just alive enough to go socialize and do the world that you got to, you know, engage with. So for me, it's like drugs robbed. I didn't even know who I was. Like I, I, the person I was when I was like 12, 13, 14, playing soccer, hanging out, I was so far from that person, but I didn't even know the person, like I had no idea who I was. So drugs just completely robbed my identity, my worth. I mean, more than anything, it's, it's this repeating self-fulfilling prophecy where the drugs make you feel like crap on a subconscious level, whether you want to admit it or not, you hate yourself because you're doing it. And then because you hate yourself for doing it, it gives you the shame. And because it gives you the shame, you do it again, just to release, to feel that release of that shame. And then it just fulfills. It's a cycle that never ends of, 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 I feel like crap because I'm doing this and then you do it and you feel more crappy and it just never ends. And and then next thing you know, if you don't have them, you can't get out of bed. If you don't have them, you can't even go to work, you know, and then you need them just to just to do life miserable, you know. So that I mean, that's what drugs did. It just it get different. It varies in intensity depending on the drug. But at the core, it's the same thing. It's all the same thing. Yeah. I love your insight. And to finish this interview. Um, because we're going to have a next part to it because some other stuff happened after, but, but for this part of your life, I have two questions for you from two different perspectives. If you could say something to somebody who's a teenager, who's kind of dabbling or interested in drugs, what would you say to that person? And as well, what message would you give to somebody who's deep into addiction like you were in your early twenties? So if you're somebody watching this and you're in high school, you're in college, whatever, wherever you are, and you've felt that I- intrigue by a you know drug or weed or whatever it is, all I could tell you is that if somebody was trying to harm somebody or kidnap somebody, they're not going to get out and tell them the plan. You know, they're not going to get out the car and say, "Come here, I'm going to kidnap you and take you to my dungeon." 
you know, it starts off great. I know it's a fun, you know, I know it's a blast. I know that, you know, when you do it, you feel like you're funnier and people, you know, seem like they like you more. I remember I used to take Xanax and it would be like every time I took Xanax, I'd have the best day of my life. Every time I took a Xanax, I would happen to like the girl that I wanted to be with would call me. You know what I'm saying? It was like every time I did these things, I would have the best day. It would be filled with, you know, activities and I would laugh till my cheeks hurt and, you know, like there there's those good days. No one's going to sit here and lie and say, or I'm not going to sit here and lie and say, it's just miserable the whole time. No, it, it starts off great. It starts off fun. But eventually it gets to the point where it doesn't even give you that satisfaction after a certain amount of time. Once the devil knows that he has you in this thing, he takes the joy then. He only gives you the joy when you're not fully bound. Once you get bound by it, he doesn't even give you the benefits because he knows he already has you. So it's like it only gets deeper and darker. It might take you four or five years. It might, you know, it, but it eventually will destroy your life. The, that, that imaginary idea of, of, I remember I used to love doing drugs because I thought it made me more creative. You know what I mean? I would sit there and listen to all these musicians, you know, Jim Morrison and The Doors and, and you know, all these different artists that I thought were so brilliant and so creative. And I would I'd be like, it's because they do acid. It's because they smoke weed. That's what I used to think. And I would think if I do this stuff, I could be more creative, tap into my creativity. And guess what? At first I did. But eventually it completely did the opposite and I couldn't be creative at all. And so my point is, is like, I understand the lure and I understand the attraction. But I promise that it's there for a reason. It's shiny for a reason. But its end is death. There's no way around it. Its end is death. I have 50, 50 friends, at least. I, I've lost count that are dead today. Pretty much all, if I go through all these memories I was talking about, all those people I'm thinking about, they're all dead or in prison. All of them. There, there is like There is nobody left. I could think of maybe two or three guys that I know that are still... Like that came from that time period that are still out there. And I think like only one of them maybe is still somehow alive getting high. I mean, they're all dead. There is no escape from that. That's what I'd say to you. Jesus is the only thing that could not only deliver you from the lifestyle, but deliver you from the snares. You can go to AA and you can get clean and you could be, you know, one of those people that you have your clean time, but it's not going to clean the inside of the cup. It's not going to put you in the place where you're sitting there with peace and joy. You know, you're going to be sitting there with bitterness and, and resentments and you're going to, all you're going to have is your clean time. And, and, and that's getting into a lane, but, but it's not worth it. it ends in death. I promise you 100%. And the thing about the last thing I'll say is that it's when I realized that the demons were playing with me the whole time, that was what really pissed me off that the demons are laughing at like the, the, they're use you're like a entertainment to them like it, it's all a show to them like you're you're just they're just throwing breadcrumbs out and watching you run around and, you know and they're while you're getting high they're destroying other parts of your your life while you're you're thinking about you while you're getting high they're over there hurting your sister or your brother sowing discord into your life in other areas ruining your jobs for the next 5 years ruining your fine like it's it's you're opening doors they and you, they're not just even going to mess with you they're going to mess with everything connected to you so that's what i say thank you for watching this interview with joshua at the end i hinted at the fact that there'll be more to his story that's because we have a part two coming up if it's out i'll put it right here but if it's not then be on the lookout in the coming weeks also if you want to know how joshua grew up and became an addict then head over to locals we went into detail about all that and let me tell you it's definitely worth a listen thanks for hanging out and i'll see you in the next one Stay blessed.